Welcome to our community. Susie Thomas with you this morning. We're visiting with Becky McCullough. She's from SAFI. So, Very of course, good. Becky, my first question is, what is SAFI? What does that stand for? SAFI stands for Specialized Alternatives for Families and Youth. Um, we are a therapeutic foster care agency that was started here in Ohio in 1984. Um, and in 1984, therapeutic meant mostly your children that had medical needs, more a high level of care. Over the years, it has um, expanded to include children with maybe a mental health issue, some depression, anxiety, um, maybe a past trauma, um, or maybe it's a child with some kind of behavioral issues. Or med- We still do have medical needs as well, um, so we're kind of a higher level of care um, for children coming into the foster care system. Okay, and this, I would think... Just the whole experience of foster care mm-hmm. might just in that experience have some kind of trauma associated Absolutely. with it. Absolutely. Um, what we are finding is that kids have experienced trauma for years. Um, and, you know, we used to believe, I've been in the child welfare system over 25 years. We used to believe, you know, if they were over the age, under the age of three, they didn't remember what happened. It didn't impact them what was going on between mom and dad. And we're finding that that's not correct. Really? We're finding that kids, that traumas have affecting kids as small as newborns and and six months old. Um, Not that they can verbalize it, obviously, but there's something that happened that gets them stuck. And that's basically, that's what a trauma is. It doesn't have to be a 9-11 to be a trauma. It doesn't have to be a big car accident to be a trauma. It could be a separation. It could be a moving, like my family up and moved to a whole other state and I had to leave all my friends. Trauma is whatever gets you stuck somewhere that you can't get past. And when you can't get past that trauma, you can't deal with that trauma, then you start having behaviors, you know, depression, anxiety, uh, withdrawal, um, ADHD, PTSD, all those kind of things. So um, we're finding more and more children um, are being impacted by trauma. And then, as you said, and then they come in the foster care system and here's a whole nother trauma. I mm. miss, lose my family. I lose not just my mom and dad, but my grandma and grandpa. I I lose my friends at that school because maybe now I'm at another school. So there's a lot that goes into it and a lot that we try to educate our foster parents on and how to deal with those things when those things come up. I'm guessing also that children develop some kind of protective shell around Mm -hmm. themselves because just everything about fostering seems temporary. This is a temporary home. I could next week be in another home. And my goodness, how how does anybody go into that kind of a situation and be whole? Absolutely. And that's our our thinking and, and our philosophy behind, you know, the extensive training and things we do is to prevent having to move a child. Because every time we move a child to a new home, you lose another little piece of that child. Oh, my, yeah. You know, they, they finally start to feel comfortable here, and now I'm getting moved again. And and sometimes it's because of a behavior they may have, mm-hmm. but it could be something completely out of their control. You know, we've, unfortunately, we've had foster parents pass away while they were had foster kids in their home. And, you know, one o'clock in the morning, you're moving foster kids to another home. Mm. So, they, they start to go, hmm, I'm not going to get too comfortable here. And that's when you see the behaviors. I'm not going to listen to you. You're not my mom. You're not my dad. I don't have to. My mom says I don't have to listen to you. And so it's all in how to, to educate and equip our foster parents to say, you're right. I'm not your mom. This is, the, this is what we're doing here. How can I help you work through that? Mm-hmm. Oh, and some of the attitude that you're talking mm-hmm. about is just part of being a child. Absolutely. Kind of figuring out what are my perimeters? What can I get away with here? What can I not get away with? And then you add fostering on top of that's another layer. Exactly. I I have four boys of my own. Um, (laughs) God bless you. (laughs) Three of them have made it to 18, and so that's good. I have an 11-year-old at home. You know, he's just kind of like, eh, whatever. But jury's um, still out, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you do. You, do, you know, these, oh, this yeah. is normal development. Kids right. are going to test boundaries. Kids exactly. are going to test limits. It's how you react to that, yeah. you know. And and there are times children that are in foster care are because the parents didn't know how to react to that mm. appropriately. Um, and something happened, something they couldn't control. Um, and that's what ends up ha- when the child gets removed. So help me understand if this is mm-hmm. right. The ideal goal would be to have the, the child get the therapies they need and the family get the help they need. Absolutely. And get that child back with its birth family. Absolutely. Second goal would be that they stay with that same foster family, maybe perhaps in a foster to adopt Correct. situation. And you do that as well. We do. 
We do. And we always say, you know, we want kids to go back home to their family, if at all possible. And if it's going to be safe, that's that's who they are. That's their history. Mm-hmm. Um, and and whatever we need to do, we do work with the biological families. We work with the county workers that's involved that have custody of the children because we don't get custody. The county still has custody. We are just an agency they place with. Um, so we try to do all that to make it work, and it doesn't always work. So then what's the next best option? Let's get them to a place where they can be stable, where they can stay um, two months, two years, however long is needed until we can get them a place for adoption. Or maybe they're an older child until they turn 18 and they age, what we call age out um, and go out on their own. Oh, golly. And that in itself needs another exactly. set of issues to be addressed. Exactly. Becky McCullough is with SAFI, Specialized Alternatives for Families and Youth. What are the alternatives, Becky? Um, we have different levels of care that our kids come in. Um, and so we look at what they need. So like with our division, we have within Ohio, there are eight divisions and SAFI is actually in seven other states as well. Mm. Um, so we are a national or nonprofit organization. Um, in our division here, that our office is here in North Canton, we do, we have a therapist on staff in the office. So maybe they need a little extra therapy right there in the home, working with that child and maybe working with the foster parent and saying, okay, this is a, these are behaviors you've not seen before. How can we help you all work together with this? Um, each child will have a case care coordinator, and that co- coordinator is going to work on what kind of coping skills we need to develop. How, can I be a liaison with the school to help that teacher understand where this child's coming from, what kind of issues they're going through? How can I be a liaison with the with the bio family and say, okay, here's what's working in the foster home. Maybe you might want to try this. What do you think of that? Those kind of things. Um, so we always want to place kids in the least restrictive setting. You know, there are places like group homes, and they are not bad places. I will never talk down about them, but that's a pretty restrictive environment. So Mm -hmm. our job is to assess the child. We do a thorough diagnostic assessment as far as what their coping skills and things are and decide where's the best place for them, along with the county and and any other interested parties to get them the best placement. How does a family know that they are right to do this? I'm thinking one of the biggest objections I hear over and over again is these kids are have issues Mm -hmm. and I have my own biological children. I need to be concerned for their safety. I don't want to bring in a potentially dangerous person into our home. Sure. So how do you get past that and find the right home for these children? Well, and there's 36 hours of pre-service training classes they have to go to. So mm-hmm. you learn a lot in that. You learn about child development. You learn about trauma. You learn about different coping techniques, you know, those kind of things. Um, and I truly believe that people just feel, for lack of a better word, a calling. That I just, mm-hmm. this has been on my heart for a long, long time. I feel like I have more to give to other children besides my own. And and it is a concern. You want to be careful who you're bringing in your home. And so throughout the whole process of the pre-service classes, the home study process, which is not just your physical home, but it's going to be what are your parenting techniques? What's your family dynamics? Who else is in your home? Obviously, if you only have a two-bedroom house and you have a son, we're not going to place a foster girl in that home. Right. So, you know, what kind of things are we looking at? Um, so we help educate them as best as we can. Um, and then we work with them as we go down the line. When when a, what we call a referral comes in and says, here's this 12-year-old with these behaviors, we look at our list of foster parents, and we don't just say, hey, they have an empty bed, put them there. It's, is this going to be a good fit? She's really good with 12-year-old boys. Miss so-and-so is going to be phenomenal. She's had children with these kind of issues before and did great. Or maybe, you know, this family over here, um, their daughter just left for college, and they're feeling a little empty nester and are going to have more time to spend with a child. So maybe this is a good family. So we try to provide as much support as we can throughout from the time what we call raise their hand from the time they either inquire through our website or call in and say, hey, I think I want more information till they get licensed. We're with them all every step of the way. And then once they're licensed, they have that worker that is their licensed home worker that will be with them throughout the process. Is there an age limit to being a foster parent? There is not an age limit at the top. You have to be 21. To, to become a foster parent. The upside, the high side of age, uh, as long as you can pass a physical from your doctor that says, yes, you're physically able um, to take care of children. We have foster parents that are in their 60s and 70s. Um, so there is no specific age. 
um, cutoff point. I'm also almost thinking that that would be a good age mm-hmm. for healthy people because you see more and more grandparents raising Absolutely. their grandchildren. Absolutely, it doesn't hurt to have somebody who's been around the right. block, and right? <laughs> and knows and these things that's already. why you know part of my job as the foster parent recruiter is to find those people who have kids that are grown or maybe retired teachers or people that are used to working with children, right? Um, and get them back involved because they do often have a lot to offer, but they're not in the midst of raising their own kids with young kids and feeling overwhelmed as much. They have, you know, they can be a great asset. Yeah, things kids. have finally calmed down. So yeah. let's let's get them heated sure, up again. Why not? What the <laughs> heck? You know, <laughs> what kind of support is available for a family who's decided to foster? Um, as I said, we have you'll have a worker that's assigned to your home. Mm-hmm. And what that means is that's not just whatever that child that comes in your home, any children that come in your home, you're going to have that person as your care coordinator forever for, for okay. as long as your home's licensed. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes other workers have to pick up. We had a situation where we had a sibling group of five boys that were placed in the same home. Um, and that's a lot for one worker. So I at that time was doing clinical. So I helped that worker see a couple of the kids and get that stuff done. Um, we also try to do a lot of networking within our foster parents. So we, we try to hook, you know, seasoned foster parents up with newer foster parents. Because I can tell you everything the regs say. I can tell you everything the books say. I can come at you from a social worker standpoint. I'm not a foster mom. Mm-hmm. Foster mom to foster mom, foster dad to foster dad can say, hey, I had a child that did that. And you know what it really seemed to work as crazy as it seems? Da, 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 da. Mm-hmm. Um, so we do a lot of try to connect them so they can mentor and support. Um we do try to have a foster care advisory board where we have foster parents come and talk to us and say, hey, what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? What kind of things can we do better? What support do you feel is lacking? Mm-hmm. What can we, what different things can we do? Um, and then we do a lot to celebrate our foster parents and our foster kids. Um, it is a tough job. It's a 24-7 job. You know, when I'm done at work, I go home. Um, these kids don't go home. They're there. Uh, so we do things like we had a training. We offered a free training. Um, at Sky Zone here out in Belden Village a couple oh, weeks perfect. ago where the parents were in training for three hours and the kids got to jump for three hours. Oh, my goodness. And Sky Zone, the staff was fabulous there. And our kids got to jump. No yeah. one knows their foster kids. They have a tag on just like every other child. They got right. to feel, quote, unquote, normal. Yeah. And they jumped and they played and they got pizza and they got drinks. And, and the parents got to do training without thinking about who do I have to get to watch the kids that day. Um, so it was really good because we connected current foster parents with foster parents going through the licensing process. We had kids with bio kids and foster kids all together. Mm -hmm. So it was really great. Um, We're hoping to do an event in the summer um, with the Akron Rubber Ducks and uh, getting some tickets, some free tickets and some meal coupons for them. Um, We did something similar last year and people seem to like it. So just trying to find ways to give back. Exactly. We do. We're there. We um, have a social worker on call 24 hours a day. So if 10 o'clock at night, Saturday morning, whatever, that foster parent needs a little extra support, they can call in um, and get one of us, one of us in the division that knows, you know, who's going, who's where, what's going on and can kind of be a support and help. One of the toughest jobs, and I've got a couple of friends who've done this, uh, must be when you are fostering the infants. Mm. And for one thing, you tend to bond with an sure. infant and you're sure. getting up every two hours just sure. like any other mom mm-hmm. and feeding this baby and, you know, getting them back to sleep again. And they might only be there for a month or so. And then it's heartbreaking when they leave. Sure. That must take a very special person to do that particular I think it does. job. I really do think it does. And um, we have several foster parents that have done little kids like that. Um, we have one that recently took uh, a set of newborn twin boys. Oh, wow. and 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 her kids are all fairly older. They had adopted children. They were Safi mm-hmm. foster parents for years and adopted children through foster parents. So she's like, wow, I'm going back to doing newborns again. Um, but I think that they understand how important those those young mm-hmm. ages are that I'm going to give them as much love as I can. I'm going to yeah. give them as much safety and security as I can yeah. and hope that. You know, when they go home or if they go home, that they've got some good, strong basis. And that's why we work with the biological families to make that as smooth as a transition as possible. But it is hard. It's hard to see them go home. Even the big kids, it's hard to see them go home sometimes um, because they become such a part of you. Um, Well, when you say that... uh we're knowing that you, we didn't think kids remembered what happened mm-hmm. or that it didn't affect them so much before age sure. three. And you're saying, oh, yes, even infants, just 
that sense of security of being held regularly Absolutely. when you need it. Uh, Absolutely. So important. Not wondering where your next meal is coming from. Not oh, wondering, my. you know. We have kids in care that hoard food and things like that in their room. And, and I had a foster mom say to me once, I don't understand. We feed them dinner. We have plenty of food here. I don't understand. And, and what we learned is that there are many days that this child didn't get to eat. And so his security was... I'm going to hide this in my room so that if for some reason tomorrow my foster parents decide not to feed me, I have something. And so we had to get creative. And the foster mom got creative and got a little, you know, bin with his name on it that he was allowed to put his stuff in that went in his room that he had complete control over. Yes. Whether he ate anything out of it or not, it was his sense of security knowing it was there. there. Almost like a depression child. Sure. You know? Yeah. Oh, it's heartbreaking. It but, is. Oh, thank goodness for what you're doing. Uh, we do need to take a little bit of a break. We're speaking with Becky McCullough from SAFI. Stay with us. You're listening to Our Community. <laughs> 